Thanks. I'll see you in a second. That was so nice. Thank you, Jebby, as he's called in the Bush, <coughs> Bush family. It's great to be here, and it's especially fun to be here with so many uh, fellow warriors and friendly faces. So I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, I'm even thrilled to be here and brag about uh, Gov former Governor Bush, even though for Texas braggadocios it's hard for us to do that. But he has been a tremendous and phenomenal uh, leader in this state, and, and now, God willing, is taking the, his uh, tremendous leadership skills, igniting a fire around this uh, effort, and I'm really thrilled to be here and wish you all the best. Now, there are other former gov you know, such a Jeff. Another former governor who's not left the vineyard, of course, is Governor Romer. Thank you for being here and for your continued good work. Marco, Tony, all of the people in, in state legislatures that you all represent, thank you for your good work. Uh, you're where the rubber meets the road. And Lynn Stanfield, thank you for your sponsorship of this event. And you know we all know that our work cannot happen without strong, uh, intelligent, active support from the business community like Apple. And I'm really thrilled that you, uh, you know that and you have stayed strong for this cause. Uh, my boss, the president, says that the measure of compassion is more than good intentions. It's good results. That sympathy is not enough. I talk about going from an aspirational approach that we had for 40 years. Just put the money out and hope for the best. It didn't work. We tried it. We've done it for 40 years. We have to do something different. I agree, obviously, with the president, and I know that with No Child Left Behind, we have started to do something different. I'm thrilled also for uh, fellow warriors like Joel Klein, where are you, Joel, my buddy, Eric Smith, John Wynn, on and on. Uh, we are a small and growing and high-quality, mighty group of warriors, and uh, we have lots to do. We have all played a role in creating a movement to inject standards, accountability, and competition into our education system. First at the state level in places like Texas and Florida, and now nationwide through No Child Left Behind. Today, the states that were the early adopters, like Texas and North Carolina and Florida, are the ones that are reaping the greatest gains in terms of student achievement. Of course, as the governor said, some continue to resist accountability. But for me, this discomfort, this uneasiness that this accountability movement has provoked is a good thing. It tells us that we're reaching higher and we're stretching the system. We have shifted our national conversation to focus on results, not just inputs like how much we spend. With President Bush, we have had a friend in reform, an ally in accountability, and a champion for choice. And if you've been paying any attention at all to what's being said on the campaign trail, and I know, Governor Romer, you have in particular, you know that continued progress is anything but inevitable. And our job is to make sure that improving our schools remains a top priority for the next administration, for local policymakers, for our country now and in the future. So to that point, I want to share some observations. In my time as Secretary of Education, I have been to nearly every state in this country. This year, alone to 22 states. I've met with state and local officials, educators, the press, parents, governors, state chiefs, members of Congress, and on and on. Three key areas have struck me as places where we must focus our efforts. One, we must remove barriers to reform. We must change our institution that we know and love as public education. Two, we must use time and personnel much more effectively. And finally, we must fully and finally and better empower families to make the best choices for their students. First, the structures, the barriers to reform that have impeded our progress and innovation. No Child Left Behind has clearly been a game changer. It has peeled the onion. It has brought transparency to our system. It introduced measurement into many of our education systems that it had never known or seen before. And as a result, we know a lot more today 
than we did six years ago. We're seeing hopeful improvements, but we're also exposing a dysfunctional system that often stifles talent instead of nurturing it and often rewards ineffective teachers but offers few incentives to improve, one that's more inclined to deny problems than to solve them. Every single day, we lose a day. More human potential is lost. The things that are discussed in that video don't happen. Resistance to change in the face of overwhelming evidence that change is needed is worse than misguided. In fact, it's educational malpractice. And the spirit of this conference and our mission is to champion, is to question these fossilized traditions, mythologies, and beliefs that have obstructed progress for our students and our teachers. Because we believe that effort without achievement is not enough, we must question our means of measuring success, our methods of delivering instruction, even our definitions of what it takes to create a successful educational experience. While other fields rocket ahead, like the governor talked about, our education system is in many ways trapped in the industrial age. The term 24-7 has no meaning for us in education. We are still stuck in a rut of six hours a day, 180 or so days a year. As a report by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce put it, most schools preserve the routines, cultures, and observations of an obsolete 1930s manufacturing plant, and that is unacceptable in today's global economy. While our shopping, our entertainment, our social networks are becoming at once more personal, more global, more interconnected, we have yet to reach that same level of customization in our schools. Joel Klein tells the story that every Friday night his wife, who works for Sony, gets an email telling her which movies led box office sales that week that opened that particular day. Technology exists that provides data in real time, so why are we not using it to personalize instruction for students in our classrooms? I was in San Diego on Monday where I met with leaders in technology and innovation. We talked about how technology is beginning to personalize education. And our challenge is to amplify those innovations to improve opportunities for our students and our teachers. We've gotten used to customization in every other aspect of our lives. We have computers built in an, an hour, eyeglasses immediately, most websites know what I want before I do, and our schools have to follow suit and become more agile, more efficient, more responsive, and most importantly, more effective. Which brings me to my second point, human capital, our teachers. It's not just students' potential that we're losing. Every year, bright teachers stream into our classrooms, and not long after, many leave, feeling overwhelmed and defeated. Up to 50% of new teachers exit the profession within the first five years. Two-thirds leave because they're dissatisfied or want a better job. Among those teachers who do stay in the classroom, many languish, unrecognized, unrewarded, unsupported. Instead of nurturing management potential, we leave it to the teachers to decide for themselves who ought to become principals. This process of self-selecting is a far cry from the private sector's strategic cultivation of promising leadership. And I'm pleased to see that performance pay and these ideas is generating a buzz on the campaign trail. I say, welcome aboard. I'm sure Governor Bush feels that way also, having spent years modeling teacher incentive programs here. We have a federal program, and have had since 06, which now supports 40 grants around the country for $100 million that the president is working hard to double and proponents of the status quo are strongly opposed to. But as you know, when it comes to education policy, the devil is in the details. All too often, people use the same terms with entirely different meanings. And we have an obligation to demand straight answers instead of so much hedging and obfuscation. For instance, when we talk about performance pay, that means pay based on student performance. 
When we talk about accountability, shouldn't that mean providing poor and minority children with at least grade level skills, just as we do for our own kids? As a parent, if somebody told me that my daughter would be on grade level within 12 years, my head would explode. Which leads me to my final point, making sure that families have the information and the power to demand more and get it. Right in Congress's backyard, people are using the language of reform to do just the opposite. They're talking about choices, but working to keep low-income children out of better schools, and that's outrageous. D.C. Opportunity Scholarships help nearly 2,000 of the poorest children in our nation's capital transfer out of underperforming schools and into the private school of their choice. It makes me wonder, how can some people justify denying poor and minority families the same options they exercise themselves? How can they consign, <laughs> amen. <clears throat> How can we consign another generation of our neediest students to our lowest performing schools? These families deserve the same opportunities that our children do. Why do we let people get away with systematically writing off somebody else's kid? Besides more choice options, we must stay strong for real accountability and transparency. We now know a good bit about our elementary and middle schools, but we still know very little about our high schools where more accountability is needed. As the person who sees and approves state accountability plans, I can tell you there is strong pressure to weaken, water down, find loopholes, and delay real accountability. These efforts often have fancy names like multiple measures or authentic assessment and sometimes not so fancy names like unfunded mandate or flexibility or recess is the word of this week. Ensuring every student's right to a quality education is what No Child Left Behind is all about. Sadly, our opponents have spent millions to trash the brand. Can you imagine what we would have achieved if all that passion and energy and money had been devoted into actually leaving No Child Behind? This law was tough, but it was essential, and we can and must do more. We must renew our commitment to every child's success, and we must build on this commitment by aiming higher and strengthening accountability. It's right and it's righteous for our kids and our nation, and it's the only morally acceptable chart to co course to chart. So I applaud the summit's focus on celebrating success and highlighting best practices. I look forward to seeing you develop concrete actions to quicken the pace of reform. I call on you to stand behind federal, state, and local policies that strengthen the core principles of reform, annual measurement, disaggregation of data, and transparency around student achievement for all students, a meaningful and real deadline like 2014, and real consequences for failure. And I ask you, or I, and I'm glad to beg you actually, for continue to, continuing to speak out about these issues. We all know how hard it can be to challenge the status quo. As Governor Bush says, in education reform, you're always walking uphill. And if you start moving forward, gravity naturally pulls you back. But as Governor Romer and others will tell you, that's all the more reason we have to push harder. And that's why I'm pleased to see Joel Klein and Al Sharpton, J.C. Watts, Cory Booker, D.C. Schools Chancellor Michelle Ree, all on the same page pushing forward for reform. This is exactly the type of alliance that we need more of. We must work closely together with like-minded people who may not be our natural allies, but all of us share a common concern for the education of our kids. We will be successful, but only if we work together across party lines and all other divisions. The work is too challenging and the opponents too numerous and too well funded to do it alone. When it comes to education policy, we must always ask ourselves one simple question. Who does this benefit, kids or grown-ups? NCLB, 
built on a historic grassroots movement that united a rare alliance of people, parents and policymakers, CEOs and civil rights leaders, Democrats and Republicans. This movement is about equipping every child with a high quality education. Whether we take this movement to the next level will determine our ability to respond to every challenge we face in the years ahead, national security, economic prosperity, and civic engagement. The rhetoric of change in this election year offers a great opportunity. Now let's make sure we all live up to our words and make it real for our students and our nation. Thank you very much. I'm Roy Romer, former governor of Colorado, former superintendent of Los Angeles School System, and my job is simply to help take your questions and uh, direct them to Governor Bush and.